good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ganesh Subarayan. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, and I work in advanced packaging. It's a distinct pleasure for, for us at Purdue to have uh, Bob Patty give us an introduction to electronics packaging, 3D integration technology and applications. Bob Patty is the president and CEO of Enhanced Semiconductors. For those of you who don't know about Enhanced Semiconductors, it is one company that you should know about because it is one of the few, very, very few, in the US that does advanced packaging. I would say, in fact, the leading company in the US that does advanced packaging. And Bob brings 20 plus years of experience in advanced packaging. He has degrees in physics as well as, as, well as electrical engineering. He has a foundational understanding as well as substantial industry experience building systems. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, yeah. Can use it for questions later. So I've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, I'm a graduate of Rose Holman uh, in 1985. Um, I got two degrees there. I thought it was a bargain, two for one special. Um, my background is as a designer. So I'm a chip designer, and I've approached semiconductors from the standpoint of what I need to make chips for my customers. Uh, I, I started out in telecommunications, which is an industry that is vastly different today than it was when I got into it. Um, it was basically run over. Actually, I worked for Mike Burke of the Burke Center. He was my boss's boss. I got to see him quite a bit, and he was sat on my board of directors about 20 years ago when I started doing uh, the advanced packaging. So I've seen a lot of change in our industry. My background in what I design has been a lot of memories and communication hardware for high performance compute. However, I have done soup to nuts, RFIDs, uh, we did an FPGA in gallium arsenide in the 90s. So a wide variety of things. That's where my outlook and vision into semiconductors comes from. How can I use semiconductors to achieve a goal? So interesting thing, how I got there. When I started doing semiconductors for the FPGA in gallium arsenide, we built it, it worked, and it was virtually no better than the CMOS equivalent. And it was, why is that? These transistors are like an order of magnitude better. And what I learned 25 years ago, it's the wire. So if you take nothing else away from the meeting today, the root of all evil is wire. Transistors are infinitely fast and take no power. What really takes all the time in our chips today and uses most of the power is the wire. And the advantage to advanced packaging at the end of the day is first and foremost, we get rid of the wire. Gives us a lot of other things, but the wire is what is making it the go-to technology. Okay, by the way, at any point you guys have some questions, raise your hand, shout out, and let me know. Happy to answer. So, we're effectively at the end of Moore's Law. Moore's Law was about what it cost per transistor. It wasn't whether we can make smaller transistors. We can, we still do. But it's the cost per transistor. And for the last 10 years, the dirty little secret is it costs us more to build those transistors. I got a great new Samsung Galaxy cell phone last year. It it has better battery life, it runs faster, but it costs twice as much as the previous one. I'm happy with that trade-off, but we can't sustain it. I'm not forecasting the end of, of uh, you know, shrinking. It'll continue, there are good reasons for it. But to get the kind of benefits that we have come to expect over the last 20, 30 years, we're gonna have to change direction. Okay. So what does it mean? How are we gonna change this? Um, I'm into railroading 
and I'm fascinated with old steam engines. And there's an interesting comparison that can be drawn here. At the end of the steam era, they made steam engines bigger and more complicated. They put more wheels in it. They made steam turbines to make them you know, more efficient, run faster. And we went from steam engines to diesel engines in five years. And I'll also note the people who won in the diesel engines were not the people who built steam engines. They went out of business. Well, I don't think Intel and TSMC are going out of business anytime soon, but it is interesting to note that the paradigm shift, first of all, it happened very quickly when it started. Diesels were around 20 years before the shift. And then all of a sudden, it happened almost overnight. And what drove it was the economics. When they took that steam engine in at night to service it, it took 21 people overnight to service that engine. With the early diesels, it took three. That's what drove it. So, what we expect by moving to advanced packaging. We can get a better cost out of it. And I'll talk more about how we can achieve that. We can certainly get better performance because we can get rid of the wire. And kind of along that, size, weight, and power. If we can pack stuff together more tightly, it certainly weighs less, physically is less. And if we shorten the wires, it saves power. Okay. So our vision of the future, and all of you in the room get to participate in this. And I want you to take it to heart. The industry is going to change radically. We see Foundry 2.0, as I like to call it, as the path forward. And it's driven by ultimately the economics and the amazing things that we can do today by practicing packaging with the technology of semiconductor manufacturing. Bringing those together has allowed us over the last 20 years to develop technology to reduce the wire length drastically. So a finishing foundry which is what we are. We look like any other fab in the world, except we don't build transistors. So the TSMCs of the world make the feed stock that we use. And I believe moving forward, they're going to be making more of that feed stock, which we call chiplets. And I'm sure all of you have heard of chiplets. It is my belief that the path forward is primarily going to be chiplets for the industry on a silicon or glass circuit card and one of the most beneficial things, shortens wire, already said that, is it allows customization. And that finishing foundry means that we can make a cell phone unique for you, and it doesn't have to be the same one that you buy. Because the path we're going down, you know, um, NVIDIA has announced, you know, their next generation GPU costs $2.2 billion to design. How many companies can do that? And the problem is, with the path we're going down, we're all going to have one CPU, one cell phone, you know. It's one memory chip, one type of memory chip, one memory chip. That is not a future that is good for the industry. The benefit is being able to customize. If I can't save money, Moore's Law for 50 plus years, has allowed us to provide more to our consumers at a better cost point. That isn't the case anymore. And unless all of you are willing to buy $10,000 cell phones, it's a pretty dim future for semiconductors. However, the important thing for all of you in the room is there is an alternative, and it's not just that Bob thinks it's a great thing to do. In fact, Intel does it. Their Ponte Verde uh, AI processor has 47 chiplets. 
every part that AMD builds today is chiplet based. All FPGAs, leading edge stuff at least, are chiplet based. They're doing this because it's more cost effective, it gives flexibility, it allows those companies to start to address niche markets. And the neat thing is that gives us a lot of interesting things to do moving forward. It enables a market change that allows small semiconductor companies to be formed once again. I've lived through an era where you could start a semiconductor company when I graduated for $10 million and go to market. Today, you have Graphcore or Cerebrus who have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars because of the fundamental cost. It's not a sustainable model. With advanced packaging, we can go back to the glory days of semiconductor startups and it gives all of you in the room the opportunity to be an entrepreneur. To join an exciting new market for semiconductors, Foundry 2.0. Okay. Already said all of that, so I don't think I have to dwell on it. Foundry 1.0 is what we have today. So the advanced packaging. I already mentioned a lot of it. The very first devices I would point into the industry is your cell phone camera. Apple was the first company to use an advanced package cell phone camera. Um, that was about seven, eight years ago. Today it's in high volume manufacturing. 100,000 300 millimeter wafers a month are consumed to build cameras for cell phones and they're all 3D integrated devices. They're doing it not because it's just a neat technology. They're doing it because it gives better performance at a lower cost point. It gives the consumer more value. That's the whole thing. Many other types of parts. Today, um, we do a lot of sensor devices where we have you know, pixels that can be built in one type of technology like gallium and tinamide and attach it to a CMOS ROIC readout chip. Um, photonic compute is a new area. A lens does a matrix multiply, which is the underlying operation for artificial intelligence, but it does it a thousand times more power efficiently than the end of CMOS will be able to produce. Um, micro displays, gallium nitride bonded to silicon for virtual reality, that is a, a large growing market. And you know, probably we're all going to get to experience that over the next few years. So it's pervasive. It's the 20 year overnight success. So now I'm gonna talk about kind of what goes into advanced packaging. Um, Workhorse for us is hybrid bonding. So we take two wafers, and there will be a demo here in a moment. Hopefully my film clip works. And we can prepare those surfaces. We polish them atomically smooth. So if you take glass, and I polish it fine enough, so to about a half a nanometer RMS, perhaps a little less, we treat it with plasma, we open up the oxide, you have hydrogen dangling off of it, and I can bring it together at room temperature, and I will fall out form a van der Waal bond. Then I can heat that up, I drive off the hydrogen, and it's permanent. And that bond becomes almost invisible. Um, this happens to be a heterogeneous integration. We did it with Teledyne. Um, that version and that version are actually similar, not identical processes. But it was uh, indium phosphide, and that's bonded to a Global Foundries wafer. And by the way, the bond here is not between the bright gray and the dark gray. It's halfway through those square gray blocks. So that's the bond interface for that. That's an eight-layer stack. Uh, that's logic that was stacked together. We did that a number of years ago, 
2015. Uh, we build as much as 20 layer stacks. That total height there is a little over uh, 100 microns, maybe 120. Each of those layers is about 12 microns. The vertical white lines you see that are TSVs, those are 1.6 microns to give you a reference. How did we save power in that? It's because if I can go vertically 10 microns rather than going horizontally 10 millimeters, I save orders of magnitude. Wire delay is a square law. If I cut the wire in half, it's four times faster. If I cut the wire in half, I save half the power. If I cut it by an order of magnitude, I save an order of magnitude. And it allows us to put things together that we can do any other way. How are you going to put indium phosphide on top of silicon? Well, there's some technologies that allow you to mix things. Mixed technology is always a mixed bag. You never get the best of either. It's a compromise. Heterogeneous integration, bonding these things together. And we can bond anything together. Half of what we build are non-silicon whatever, usually bonded to silicon. Silicon is a great workhorse, does wonderful things. But gallium arsenide can run faster. Gallium nitride is great for power. Indium phosphide is great for front ends. Different materials give you different advantages. That's an added benefit. Okay. So the process technology under this is very simple. I won't say a lot about it. We build this vertical interconnect. Those little plugs I should have pointed out, they're copper. We can also use nickel. So we get wafers from global foundries, from TSMC, from Intel, from whomever. We usually put a couple more layers of metal on it. Um, I got good news, physics works. So we engineer that copper plug so that when we heat it up, the copper plug expands and makes contact. When we go through this process, when we do that CMP, the chemical mechanical polishing, we use a little trick. We're able to polish that surface so the glass is real smooth. And at the same time, we lower the copper just below the surface. So when I bring this together at room temperature, it's a glass to glass bond. There's no electrical bond. And then when I heat it up, to get rid of that hydrogen and reform silicon dioxide, copper expands. And it expands more than glass. And the result is I drive that copper into each other and it will form grains across it so it looks like it was an original sequentially manufactured piece of copper in sequentially manufactured glass. And the good news is we can do that with virtually any material. So, I'm going to hopefully be able to play this little piece of magic. So, this is one of my highly calibrated engineers. And we're going to bond this silicon wafer, and he has a glass wafer, so we can see what goes on. And it's a, a little difficult to see, but he's going to press in the middle of the wafer, glass wafer here, and you'll see the wave front of bonding propagate out. So there's a little thin sheet of air. And you can see him press on it, and you can see that wave front propagate out. That wafer is now bonded. You can pick it up, handle it. I can take it apart. So the good news is I can put this together. I can look at it with an IR microscope, for instance, and I can verify that there were no particles that got in there and that the alignment was good. If it wasn't, we can use a razor blade and pry those apart. We call it a wedge, otherwise known as a razor blade. But the amazing thing about that technology is at room temperature, it makes it easy to align. Uh, we started when I, I started the business, we did copper thermal diffusion bonding. The problem is, is we had to do that alignment in situ and then hold it in place at 300 degrees C. And if you're using only silicon, that's not so bad. 
but if I'm using gallium nitride with silicon or gallium antinamide with silicon, the problem is their CTE mismatch does ugly things. So it's hard to get them aligned both at 300 degrees and then when they cool, not destroy themselves because the CTE mismatch causes the stress in the wafer. Um, and by the way, the gentleman whose finger you saw, he invented hybrid bonding. His name is, name is on the original patents. He doesn't actually work for me. He works for uh, uh, Ziptronics when he invented it and works now for Xperi, who develops more technology. So, you've seen a famous finger. So here's some examples of that hybrid bonding. And the reason I'm dwelling on this is it's one of the main tools in our toolbox for advanced packaging. But I want to make it clear, the toolbox is vast. Semiconductors today, if you go to TSMC and you say, I want to do a three nanometer chip, to me it's the equivalent of going to Ford and saying, you know, I'm, I, I want to buy a car, what color can I pick? And he says, any color you want as long as it's black. Because that's kind of what it is. You're very limited in your choices. Advanced packaging is a smorgasbord. Think about it. If you open up any electronic device, all the different types of packaging you can see. And the subtleties of advanced packaging are another dimension of that. It's a smorgasbord. It requires lots of engineering. Much, much more than is required to do foundry today. Not, I'm not saying it's trivial to build a one nanometer wraparound great tra gate transistor. It isn't. It takes a lot of people studying it and working on it. But as an industry, we are going to consume a lot more engineers, require a lot more engineers in advanced packaging than people who are going to be designing one nanometer transistor processes orders of magnitude more. And it's a job that is interesting, it's dynamic. Every job you do is different. We joke about someday we're going to do two chips that are the same or two assemblies that are the same. Because it is this smorgasbord and you're tuning it to get that value to our customer and in turn their customer. So. Here are some of the bonding things that we've done. We have uh, gone down to 0.8 micron pitch for micro displays. So a 0.4 micron pad and bonding about 10 million pixels in a micro display, you know, about a quarter inch on a side. Uh, and that was gallium nitride because that's a really good material to build LEDs. Bonded to silicon, which is a real good material to control and drive them. The examples here are submicron. Our bonder, uh, the main bonder that we use today to put these together at wafer level and at dye level is plus or minus a micron. So in manufacturing, most of what we do is three to five micron pitch. So we build typically hundreds of thousands or low millions of interconnects for every dye. It's not uncommon that we have a billion to 10 billion interconnects on a wafer. And because physics works, we usually yield all of it. When we have yield failures, it's usually some particle got on and we lose a little bit of, a few die around where that particle is in the bond. So it's a high yielding technology. In production, like in cell phones, I know that they have 99.999% yield in what they build. Okay. So, what else is required? Well, if we're going to build chiplets, we need circuit cards. Um, back in the dark ages, when I graduated, we had 7400 series logic. We thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, these chips were base functions. You assembled them together on a circuit card, and you could build anything. Since then, We've evolved to custom ICs and FPGAs, and it allows you to build a lot of things, virtually anything, 
But if you're building custom ICs, you're losing flexibility, or it's at least cost you a lot more. At some level, using interposers, we're rolling back the clock 40 years. Because it's now a silicon or glass circuit card, and the wires, instead of being measured in you know, mils and millimeters, are measured in nanometers and microns. But we get the effect of the scaling. And in fact, it is so effective building interposers. We can build thicker metals than they can typically build on a standard semiconductor device. And we can use things like glass, which have better dielectric constants. So we can actually take chips apart, put them into chiplets, and they will run faster and use less power than the original monolithic device. And if I've made them into chiplets, and ARM made a vague announcement, and I've talked to them about it, what did they mean? ARM is getting into the chiplet business because they found customers want variance on processors. And if it costs you a billion dollars to define, you know, build a processor, that makes it a pretty limited set of processors you can choose from. So their plan is they're going to have a collection of chiplets, and if you need two of those units and three of those units and one of those, and I want a, this kind of memory controller, you can assemble them yourself on your own interposer and build that processor. And instead of it being a billion dollars, it's $100,000, $200,000. It's a much different value proposition. And that means, once again, that you can have startups, you can customize, and you can give the consumer what he wants. The road we're going down, we're going to build that one super cell phone chip. And you're all going to buy the same one. And you're all going to use 10% of the capability. But you still have to pay for all of it. If we convert to a chiplet world, and you can afford to build 50 different kinds of cell phones, maybe I don't make it just 10% of the capability, make it 15. But that means that the intrinsic material cost of that cell phone is perhaps 85% less. So I give you the Moore's Law advantage. The cost went down, and I can put more functionality in it. And you're going to be happy. The manufacturer is going to be happy. I'll be happy if I get to build it. This is how the world changes. So our silicon circuit board here, and we build these at our factory in North Carolina. Um, we build glass, fused silica. Um, there is a, a manganese dioxide version, or manganese oxide version of the substrate, which is metal. It gives you some other unique RF properties. So we have a large selection of different circuit boards. One other thing that I'll mention that some of you may be familiar with, if I'm building a device and I'm going to interface it on a circuit board, I need ESD structures to protect the pads from electrostatic discharge, even if it's going to be machine assembled. Um, grand scheme of things, that's a good chunk of a picofarad. If you're running at a gigahertz, that's going to take a milliamp. If you're running at a, you know, a, a terabit, now you're talking about an amp. It's a lot of power. When you build things in 2.5 and, and 3D, we don't need those devices. So that part of the load is not required. The reason we don't need it is we build it in a semiconductor fab, just like you build the transistors. So there's no reason for us to have that ESD protection. The only thing we require is antenna diodes, which are typically required in the back end of line anyways. So we've been building them like that for 15 years. It's a very effective, and that's one of the reasons you can go to chiplets and not suffer a penalty. Okay. It's the wiring. I already alluded to this. We live in a world of a ball of wire. You know, if you hear about any of the latest, greatest generation of processors, they talk about how many you know, kilometers or tens of kilometers of wire they now have in them. If you can reduce the wire, if you can go into 3D 
you reduce the power, you improve the performance, improve the speed. It was a square law. The other thing you get out of it that a lot of times isn't as obvious as span of control. So if I have to do something within a clock period, how far can the clock go on the piece of silicon in one clock tick? That's a very important criteria. As a designer, put my designer hat on again. Today's processors actually already have to work in waves. On an Intel processor, I put the clock in here, there are multiple clocks going on in the chip related to that. They have to retime about every millimeter across the die. If I go into 3D, I physically can bring more transistors into the clock domain. That gives me a lot more flexibility in the ability to generate more performance per clock. And clock power is a real problem because those stupid flip-flops consume power even if they're not changing state. Half the power in a typical chip is clock distribution. This is one of the reasons that, you know, the, uh, you know, processors today are 100, 200 watts. It's the repeaters and it's the flip-flops which don't do anything. Okay. The other part of this. I've alluded to all of the wonderful things that we get. We reduce the wire, we get span of control. Um, it's the heterogeneous materials. It's the unique things we can bring together. In that cute diagram, and that's from Georgia Tech, um, we have, at one point or another, built every component on there except the battery. You can only bring these things together when you start looking at heterogeneous integration. You can mix these technologies. Because many technologies, especially with sensors, are incompatible. They're materials which don't get along with silicon or transistors or the process temperature you need to do things at. By doing this bonding, we can develop the sensor in one process, completely divorced from the transistors that eventually need to run it. But because we bring it together, we get rid of the wire length, which is often inhibiting the performance at the end of the day. You know, you're, if you build a, micro, if you build a, a silicon detector, it's basically a, a charge junction. And if I'm going to, dis if I put that together with solder bumps or wire, the problem is I have something which is perhaps femtofarads of energy that I'm now trying to push through picofarads of capacitance. Okay. Other things in our toolbox. Chiplets. I've already said it, I believe are the future. Uh, we have a good example is the AMD processor, which I have out there at the lower left. The hand is uh, holding a Ponte Verde processor from Intel. On the top there, that's a, that black and white image is a reconstituted wafer that was done with Tower. We happened to build that one. Um, those are five different chiplets that are bonded down on top of a another large master chip that uh, Tower built on the wafer. We planarized glass over it and then they wired everything back together on the top and put a pad out. So they get a composite function from six different technologies that you could not have built together. Die to wafer has another advantage. I know that they're good die, so I get a yield advantage. And that's where this started, by the way. You know, Xilinx thought that was a a winning combination. They didn't know how to build die that were bigger than a reticle. Certainly couldn't yield it. They started by, let's make smaller die. And it worked phenomenally well. Let's see what else is in our bag of tricks. Other things in the technology is microfluidics, bringing biology on chip. 
And there's a fair amount of these that exist in nature. Most of the disposable tests, if you've ever taken one at a doctor's office with a little bit of blood or urine or spit, um, those are microfluidic electronic circuits. An extension of that is cooling. So the good news is we're going to get rid of all this wire and we talk about it as we're going to create this, you know, smoking hairy golf ball. Because what we want is something that is as small as possible, as tightly connected as possible, and it's going to generate lots of heat. So how do we get rid of it? And the answer is, you know, the two and a half, the 3D, the advanced packaging, it does great things, but it doesn't eliminate all the power. So somehow you have to cool. So we've built two-phase liquid cooling. Um, you can uh, create chips by doing that that are measured in thousands of watts. DARPA has a program right now, the goal is to cool 7,000 watts in a chip that's 30 by 30 millimeters. Multiple layers, granted. They, uh, they're targeting seven layers of devices. And while that sounds, sounds daunting, the cooling is actually not that difficult. Delivering 7,000 watts to a device is probably a bigger problem than cooling it. You know, at one volt, that's 7,000 amps. An arc welder is a few hundred amps. So, other things fundamentally enabled. Quantum compute is fundamentally enabled by advanced packaging. We will never have a quantum computer of any import without advanced packaging, period, end of sentence. Because the only way we can build enough qubits is to build individual devices and bring them together. And you can get coherent qubits to jump chip to chip if you get them close enough in 2.5D assembly. And that's been published. We have a customer that does it. I already mentioned the optical compute, it can pick. Electronic integrated circuit, the photonic integrated circuit. Um, photonics wants to be built on the scale of microns. Electronics, to run it, wants to be built at the scale of nanometers, small nanometers at that. Those are incompatible. If I build the photonics in a 12 nanometer process, it's infinitely expensive. I can't build the electronics in the photonic process because it's too big. That combination has existed in the industry for probably the last 20 years. They have soldered those together typically. But now we're back to I need the ESD. So I'm now going to build my 100 terabit per second AI processor, which is going to consume 100,000 watts. That doesn't work. If you do it with this kind of integration, you go from you know, a picojoule per bit to a few femtojoules per bit. It fundamentally enables it. If we want photonic compute, if we are going to have heterogeneous compute, if we're going to have the next generation of sensors, it has to be done with advanced packaging. There is no answer at one nanometer that fixes this problem. Okay. Sensors, it's half of what we build. Many times, they're incompatible processes. We build sensors for CERN, for high energy physics. We build lots of different chemical sensors. A lot of times, the fundamental materials just don't get along with each other. You have to fabricate them se separately. And if I have to connect them by a large amount of water, or water, wire, or large solder balls, an ESD, it doesn't work. Very sensitive atomic sniffers require advanced packaging. It's the only path forward. Okay. Let's see what else is in my bag of tricks here. Well, I guess I'm going to get on to the problem at hand. So this is all wonderful. We've solved all the problems. Not. 
the problems that you need to solve. Physics is great and it sucks. You know, CTE is the root of all evil for most of what we do. I can use all of these great materials and if I all of a sudden run them really hot or I run them really cold, I'm going to build that quantum computer and it's going to run at 4 millikelvin. Fantastic! Except the silicon wants to eat the gallium nitride. <laughs> the need for multi-physics, design tool improvements, and really evaluating this set of problems is immense. It's where the research needs to be. It is your job in this next generation to solve those problems. And a lot has to be done. EDA tools today are woefully inadequate. We may have done a fantastic job on engineering a bunch of this, but we are way, way, way behind on our need for co-physics, verification, validation, digital twin simulators. Things that you folks are learning today are required to be successful in this industry. And I hope by now you believe this is the future. This is it. Okay. What other neat things do I have here? So all those tools are going to do what we do by hand today, which is solving this balancing act. How do we model process differences? My silicon wafer came out fast in process. My gallium nitride was a little slow. And I have an in-gas wafer that's in the middle. Can I put those together? Will they yield? Is there any effect on that, on the thermal performance, the sensitivity? Can I cool it? It's how do I balance these things? It'll be partly the tools. A lot of it will be the skills you learn in your job. The hands-on of advanced packaging is, quite honestly, it's way better than most of the rest of the semiconductor industry. Because you can get a feel for what works. You can achieve greatness in advanced packaging. Okay. As I said, we have a fab. Uh, I won't dwell on it a lot. We have lots of neat equipment. Um, in our fab in North Carolina, we build uh, Ferraris, Lamborghinis, and Rolls Royces. So we build niche products. And that's where the market has evolved to, but it's exploding. It's exponentiating today. We will quadruple in size this year ourselves. So rapidly growing is an understatement. Um, the, the technologies, right now we do most things at about a one micron scale. Over the next two to three years, we will scale all the way to the end of 193 dry and then to the end of 193 immersion. That's how fast the market's moving. Because of the needs and the requirements, people have latched on. They figured out this is the right thing to do. So it's doing things at the very edge of technology. I'm just going to skip that. Lots of neat things. OK. So this is where I'm going to recruit all of you. So we're building two new fabs in southern Indiana, down in Odin, a couple, well, about an hour and a half south of here. And it is reflective of the growth in the industry. We're trying a little something different. We're building a cooperative manufacturing partnership. Because if the future is advanced packaging and additive semi semiconductor manufacturing, it's adding unique processes, there are 20 or 30 companies kind of like us that are in different facets. I mentioned Indiana Integrated Circuits. They have a neat tool in the toolbox. Mosaic builds glass interposers. They have a unique tool in the toolbox. DECA does um, wafer reconstitution. 
It's a unique tool. HRL has Mecca. I can go through this. There's many, many unique technologies. It's a smorgasbord. And so we're building a factory that many of those people can participate in and help us build, supply that smorgasbord for the customers. So a lot of variety. And to do it, I need 1,000 a, a recruits. So please send me all of your business cards and contact information afterwards. Um, the factory actually will open hopefully in about two years, uh, in 2025, late 2024, maybe. It's an example of how the market's going to change. We're a small company. I have 38 employees today. Um, it's a long and tortured history. We did 3D memories under Tezzeron prior to Enhanced. Uh, I have a lot of bullet holes from learning things about advanced packaging and being in business and being an entrepreneur. I've had nine startups. So if any of you need advice on what not to do, I have a long list I can supply. But this is an opportunity that you have, really has not been seen by engineers, electrical engineers, in I think two decades, at least, maybe three. We're gonna provide lots of interesting packaging. Uh, the slides will be available if anybody really wants to know the specifics on it. So, summary. The new Moore's Law is system levels, Moore's, Moore's Law. It isn't dependent on the transistor anymore. It's what is the value you provide to the end customer, no matter how you derive it. And I'm telling you it will be derived because you reduce the wire, and heterogeneous integration gives you a kicker. And that kicker through heterogeneous can be orders of magnitude. Advanced packaging is driving a revolution. Intel does it, AMD does it, Marvell builds a family of it, ARM has announced it. It's not just Bob thinks it's a good idea, the world thinks it's a good idea. It changes your career, your life. Ultimately, it's about cost. I wish people just did technology because it was really neat. I'm a technologist, I love that. But what's driving it today is it's the best way to do it. It gives more return on investment. It will reinvigorate our semiconductor industry and make your lives much better as a consumer and as an engineer. I think it'll be phenomenally better because you can be an individual contributor, you're going to get the opportunity to participate in new semiconductor devices that simply have been impossible. So that's my last slide. If you have any other questions, or any questions, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it, answer those. A fantastic introduction to advanced packaging. Bob alluded to both the performance improvement by reducing the wire length, but he also in the end talked about how it can be a significant difference in terms of cost. What he didn't emphasize is that it's also a national security priority. Yes, it is. So that's an important thing. It's advanced packaging as a way we can address supply chain issues of the future. So that's a very important driver as well. So if you have any questions, um, please wait. I'll bring the mic over to you so you can ask a question on the mic so it can be recorded. And uh, yes, please. So I was wondering, with your background in physics, how has that helped you understand the limitations and also the possibilities of electronics? Because electronics is fundamentally driven by materials technology, and it has been for 20, 30 years. Um, my background, I, I had materials engineering in physics as well as applied optics. 
those two are a wonderful combination because communication is traveling to optics. So that was certainly a, a really good decision 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, but understanding what is happening at a material level is immensely helpful because we have been dealing with putting things together that it is very hard to see whether or not you did it right. So you have to deduce it. I think physicists um, are used to trying to solve problems and figure out root cause without being able to observe it. You know, I'm always amazed when they talk about, based on this observation, we know that that star was born at this time. And it's the deduction based on the data that you get. A lot of what we have done to get here is we have deduced it. And it comes back to physics. If you look at the basic physics principles, fortunately, you pretty much can't violate those. So you have to come up with a model of why this worked or didn't work based on you know, facts. You can logically deduce. So it's, uh, I think being a, a physicist was a great help. Although most of my life I've been an electrical engineer. Other questions? Um, so obviously you said you have experience in uh, physics, uh, materials engineering, and electrical. If you were to go back to school now and you were choosing from those three majors, which do you think would be the most helpful for uh, advanced packaging? I suspect physics um, because it teaches you deduction. Don't get me wrong, I, uh, most of my design work, I'm an electrical engineer through and through. Um, I still can do circuit design pretty well. I'm terrible at you know, Verilog code, but I can write it. Um, I think the skills that you learn in college are most important from the skills you broadly learn. Um, I, I know this will, will crush, you know, mathematics teachers. Uh, I haven't needed to do any differential equations in my career. Um, occasionally I need to do algebra. That's about the most advanced. But it's the skills that you learn and how to do them. It is less important whether you're a physicist or a double E or a chemi than the skills that you have learned to problem solve. If you're a good problem solver, you can be any of those. Um, if I look at the, the people I work with and my team, it, it's a smorgasbord. I, I have chemis, I have a couple other physicists, I have electrical engineers, I have computer engineers, I have software people. I have people who have a high school degree and that's all they have. I mean, it is being meticulous, it's being curious, it's being good at deductive reasoning. Um, there's a lot of life skill to being successful in any occupation, in my opinion. So as a double E, you'll do just fine. I also have another question. Uh, does enhanced semiconductors have any co-ops or interns or any programs like that? Um, we have had them from time to time. We will definitely have them in southern Indiana when the fab opens up. And I plan to, uh, we will be extensively recruiting. Much of the conversations we've had today is about workforce development. Uh, our number four hire in Indiana was somebody in charge of workforce development. 95% of our staff will be recruited from uh, the universities and the trade schools in Indiana for our fab. We're only going to bring in about 5% to seed getting started. So we're going to have a lot of openings and I firmly believe that internships are a great way for everybody to test drive. You of us and us of you. And I have to comment that of the 95%, 90% will be from Purdue. Yeah. <laughs> There's one here. So 
So beyond um, o- the f- uh, fab that you can make like in Odin, um, what are other locations that Enhanced Semiconductors works with and why did it choose Odin? Because I know one thing in Odin is very close to Crane Naval Base. Yep. So is that part of it? Yes, it's not an accident that we located in, in, in at uh, Crane's back door. Um, we have our fab in Morrisville, North Carolina, which is uh, right near the uh, Raleigh-Durham Airport. So it, we're not actually in Research Triangle, we're right next to it. Um, corporate, where we do design and test, is just outside of Chicago, it's Batavia, Illinois. Um, we currently have an office in Odin, and we're starting to do some, uh, we're prepping. I'm getting equipment, we'll start to do a, some assembly down there, package assembly. Um, beyond the two fabs that we already have planned, um, I don't have any other grand plans for expansion this week, but uh, I'm I, certainly in terms of opportunities, I can tell you it's global. Um, we do deal with customers all over the planet. One of the main reasons I live in the Chicago area is it's close to an airport. Um, I spend most of my life traveling because this is of interest to a lot of people. We have, we have customers worldwide. So you, uh, you definitely, in advanced packaging, you have career security. One last, we'll take one last question. I was just curious, how does 3D packaging affect reverse engineering? It happens that I have some students involved in looking at ways of countermeasures against reverse engineering. And yeah, how does this affect that? Um, it, it helps a lot. I'm not going to tell you it's, it's perfect. You can't separate these layers. Once you put them together, um, you can delayer it. There are technologies to do like X-ray tomography and do digital delayering of devices. Um, however, in the, in the government's view, you can build things into 3D structures that prevent tapering. I can make it very difficult for you to do that X-ray tomography and it really doesn't work on deep submicron. Can't resolve that small. And if I make it so that if you start delayering the device, you break it, not to mention, people have delayered, they can do magnificent things. You give them a 20 layer stack with, you know, 300 process steps that went into it, and each one of those devices has another, you know, 30 masks, it, it, they, they never get through it. Um, it's because the world is not a perfect place and you start etching it and whatnot and all of a sudden you don't know what layer you're on, on you know, which die and which chip. You don't have to make it completely impossible, you just have to make it so difficult they can't get there. Um, it certainly defeats the hacker. It may not defeat the nation state that is you know, funded, perhaps our friends in Russia or China for instance, but you certainly defeat organized crime or the odd hacker in a lot of the rest of the world. You make it impossible for them. For the US government, and one of the reasons we went to Crane, the government is my largest customer. Uh, to be clear, I have commercial customers, many of which you would easily recognize the name of. Um, they certainly believe what I'm saying about you can mix all of these, chiplets is the future. You can build next generation electronics for hundreds of thousands and millions rather than billions. And their problem is they don't build a million tanks. They don't build a million fighter jets. If every chip costs them a billion dollars to design, they can't do those 50 custom chips for the next fighter jet. They are the poster child. They need advanced packaging. That's why they are heavily investing, and that's why I'm in their backyard. <laughs>